Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to, um, thank you for joining us today. And I, first of all, I wanna say welcome to Crandallette for all of our new incoming freshmen and your families. And tonight we're here to help you get some of the information. We're sure you have a lot of questions on. And um, I think before we get started tonight, uh, it's a good idea to start with a prayer. So let's do that together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving God, our creator, our savior, our companion, bless this journey of a new school year that we undertake today. Refresh our souls and renew our spirits as we embrace the beautiful ministry you have called us to. We welcome those who are new to this community and ask that you strengthen them to share the wonderful gifts you have given them. Lord, open our hearts as we prepare for the future of students to this school and may you guide them to return with open hearts and minds eager to learn. Help remind us of the mission we have all committed to carry forward as we move always toward profound love of God and love of neighbor without distinction, with an orientation toward excellence, tempered by a gentleness, peace, and joy. We ask this in your name, amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. God is my light. So my name's Annette Eros, and I'm the president here at Condolette High School. And I'm gonna introduce the uh, other panelists that we have that have joined us here tonight to answer all your questions. So first we have our director of admissions, Jessica Mix. I'm sure a lot of you already know who she is, given that, we, that you're all new and, and she was your main point of contact till now. Dr. Elizabeth Chapineau is our director of academics and ed support. And we, ed tech, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Um, Jennifer Reinwald is our VP of student life. And Kevin Cushing is our principal. So I wanna um, start with a few ground rules just for tonight, because we know you have a lot of questions, um, not only as freshmen coming in, but also as coming into us and joining us in distance learning. And of course, none of us wanna be in this position but we're here to share with you all of the plans that we have made to make sure that all of our students have the best educational experience possible. Um, for this format tonight, we anticipate us doing about a 20 minute presentation to share information with you. And then we'll take questions. If you wanna use the Q&A section of the Zoom platform, then we'll be able to look at the questions um, as we're going through. And I will monitor those and um, share them with our other panelists as you know, if they're in line with some of what we're talking about and the subject matter. And then we're also gonna have a Q&A portion of this Zoom call that will take live questions too. But we encourage you to send them in advance to make sure that we get through everybody's questions. This, this is being recorded for future reference, so it will live on our website. And it's really important to know that um, on our website, we have a COVID-19 Page that has a lot of resources on it for you. This is always going to be the most up-to-date and accurate information about Condolette, what we're doing, what our plans are, um, how, what if plans are changing, what it's going to look like. So this will be there. Our return to school guidelines are there already. Hopefully you've had a chance to review those, but we know there's a lot of detail. So um, tonight we're focusing on distance learning. We, we anticipate that this is how we are going to be coming back to school, hopefully just for a short period of time. When we do get to the hybrid model, we will host another town hall to answer your, your specific questions regarding that. We'd like to try to stay focused on the distance learning model right now because we want to keep the timeline reasonable about what we have together tonight and give you the most pertinent information. We also know that a lot of, um, Folks are going to have questions about athletics. We're going to touch on that tonight, but we don't have a lot of answers, unfortunately, and we do anticipate most likely hosting some kind of a town hall to address a lot of the athletics questions that we have. So we know this is an evolving situation. We thought the best way to share with you real time is to host a Zoom. So hopefully you have patience with us tonight. We'll get through as many questions as we can. And then as you have questions that pertain to anybody, any of the panelists uh, here tonight, feel free to reach out to them as well. But I, I think the, the first spot for you to start is, is on our website if, if we don't cover it tonight and then we'll move forward from there. But really what we're here for is to make sure you have all of your questions answered. So we're gonna start with Jessica Mix. 
again, our Director of Admissions, and uh, she's going to get us started tonight. Thanks, Jess. Hello, everybody. Again, I'm Jessica Mix. I think I've had the opportunity to meet most of you. Um, we just wanted to start by saying congratulations. We've almost made it through the summer. Um, and we are just so excited to welcome you and help you transition from eighth grade to ninth grade year. Again, this is not the way we intended the ninth grade year to start off, um, but we're gonna get through it together. And I just wanted to reassure you, um, no question is a silly question. Please continue to reach out and ask me any question that you have. I'm happy to play operator all the way through first semester. And to, I know you guys don't understand just yet, like what adults cover what and who, who's responsible. So I'm happy to get you to the right person um, that you need to get to until you feel a little bit more acclimated and until you fully understand um, the org chart and how Crondelet works. So please don't hesitate to continue to reach out. We are also going to continue to reach out to you. Um, don't, don't worry, your students will be ready for the first day of distance learning. Um, we know that everybody's distance learning experience in eighth grade looked a little bit different. So I wanted to fill you in a little bit about how our overall schedule works and what distance learning at Crondelet very generally looks like, because um, there may be some norms that, that, that your, your student isn't used to. Um, so first of all, we host our distance learning like a regular school day. So our students need to be available from 8.15 to three o'clock every day. Um, it runs like a bell schedule. So we do take attendance. It's really important for students to be engaged and coming to every period. They are gonna be interacting with their teachers. Um, and Dr. Chapin is gonna give you a little bit more insight to that as we move forward. But just so you know, it is, it is a school day. We run a bell schedule. There are breaks built into the day. There's lunch, passing periods built into the day. We do have a flex period on Wednesdays. Um, and Ms. Reinwald's gonna explain that a little bit more. So we have our rotating blocks on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and that flex day on Wednesdays, except the first Wednesday. Um, so our first day of school is August 12th, and we are gonna start with a zero to seven period. So that's a day where we have 45 minute classes. And really that day is just for students to meet their teachers, get to know each other a little bit better before we jump into the full distance learning um, with our block periods the next day. There's gonna be homework, um, lots of breaks, lots of time um, for your students to interact with their teachers, um, but just kind of wanted you to have an understanding that we do run it like a typical school day. So again, we'll get to more of those questions as we go through. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pass that to Mr. Cushing, our, our principal, who's gonna give us some more details. Thanks, Jess, and welcome everybody. So to kind of give an overview of how we got to where we are today, um, we had fully planned on introducing a hybrid model, beginning of the year in a hybrid model, where um, we would bring half of our students on Monday, Tuesday, and the other half on Thursday, Friday. I want everyone to understand that this, this isn't our decision. Um, we have to abide by the mandates of Contra Costa County Public Health. And so when, they, when the governor came out with his mandate a couple Fridays ago, um, and the county let us know that we had to see those 14 consecutive days of declining trends, that meant we all, every school in Contra Costa County had to go to this distance learning program. Um, obviously, it creates safety and it's gonna help us get the virus under control, which is you know, kind of our, our, our primary objective right now. But knowing that at some point we're going to reach that 14 day decline, we will be ready to transition back to the hybrid environment. We wanna make sure that we introduce students back to campus um, so that it's phased in, so we can keep, make sure we're, we're keeping a handle on the spread of the virus. So, um, you know, a lot of people think that as a Catholic school, we can kind of determine what it is that we wanna do and we can't. Public health mandates trump everything that we want to do or are able to do as, a, as an independent um, Catholic school. Same thing applies to charter schools and independent schools as well. So, um, know that we, we are, the schedule we created allows us to move back and forth between that distance learning and the hybrid. And then eventually when we're able to go back fully face-to-face -face on campus with all of our students and teachers, um, when we do make a move to the hybrid model, we'll, we'll have at least three or four days of orientation. We'll bring students back on campus to introduce what classrooms look like, traffic flow patterns. We'll, we'll reinforce the distancing and the masking and all that that needs to take place to ensure that students are as safe as possible. And if families choose, they can stay in the distance learning model all semester long. And we'll, we'll address the springtime when we get there, because who knows what that's gonna look like. Um, 
Also know that our distance learning is very successful. Before I introduce Dr. Chapineau, we know that based on what we, the results we had with our assessments last spring, that students learned and they demonstrated that in the online environment, which is why we were able to provide letter grades all the way to the end of the semester. Um, our, our map testing showed that we were actually well above national average in our math learning, even while we were online, and that English scores stayed steady. Um, and then our AP pass rates, we just got those are all equivalent to what we've had in previous years. So there's lots of data and lots of indicators that show that even though we're not face-to-face -face and we're in the comforts and confines of our homes, we know that students will learn in this model. And, I, and again, I reiterate that as soon as we can get back to bringing students onto campus, we will pivot and make that move um, as soon as we get direction from public health. And, and again, we'll make that transition a smooth one as well. For more details on the academic side of things and the schedules, um, here's Dr. Chapineau, our VP of Academics. Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to Carondelet. As um, uh, Mr. Cushing said and everybody before me, that we, we are bringing you in on a very extraordinary and extreme time. And yes, safety is our number one priority. And as Mr. Cushing put it out, we have planned a year that will allow us to be extremely flexible um, going in and out of shelter and even accommodating um, families that want to stay in shelter when we do come back uh, based on personal concerns or needs. So we have set everything up. You are coming in after we were uh, privileged enough to have a guinea pig period, I guess, with our, our shelter in place. That was, we, that was actually, a, um, everybody rallied, all our teachers were amazing, and we were able to transition to uh, our first model of online learning um, in March very quickly, almost seamlessly. I think we had one day of orientation for the students and were able to, to keep learning going. Um, we've learned a lot through that model. We have adapted our schedule. We have prepared in a way that will allow us to be completely um, flexible and, and make sure that we, we provide the best learning environment for your daughters. Um, one note, we have about 100 students enrolled in our Cougar Prep program right now. And I just want to point out that what you're going um, to be living, what your daughters are going to be living in, in August when they start school is completely different. That is an absolutely online class. It is asynchronous. They come in and out whenever they want. That's not what's going to be happening. Come start of school, we are shifting to real school in the sense that we, we have expectations uh, related to all sorts of engagement for the students. We do expect them to be present all day with us and that, that they take advantage of as many extra opportunities. I know they're virtual, but be they for academics or student life, we really want them to be engaged and get to know their community and get to meet new friends and, and take advantage of everything that we have. We will provide a lot of information on how they can access these things. We also want to make sure that between now and the start of school, if they haven't gotten through tech training with Mrs. Tracy, that they do that. It's really important that they not struggle with how to use our online platforms or how to use the tools, because that is uh, an exercise in frustration that we really want them to, to avoid having as they're dealing with um, starting school, starting high school, and being online on top of that. Um, finally, we also want to make sure that that there are rules of engagement and the teachers will put them in the syllabus. It is part of our, our protocols, but there, there is online um, etiquette. We, we expect our students to abide by ethical behavior. Uh, we want them to, to train them and help them uh, plan their time and be effective. And I think one of the big things that we are all, both adults and students, getting much, much better at is reading directions and not just counting on somebody going over things uh, for us. Um, for our teachers, we have uh, added all sorts of resources to try to create and give them tools to make learning engaging in this online platform. Um, and they will be providing a synchronous piece. There will be a check-in, there will be activities, there will be things that happen real time. So there's not that delay in getting a response from your peers or from your teacher. Um, we also will be managing Schoology, uh, our learning platform, so that everything is clear. All the teachers will have the same protocol. There will be an event with an agenda of what they're supposed to be doing today. All the assignments will be posted there and they will be using um, all sorts of um, engaging tools that will help us shift our focus from uh, towards 
multiple formative assessments so that we're constantly checking in and making sure that they're learning and doing well. And finally, we'll be even bringing tools for science classes like a swivel camera where the teacher can have them live a virtual lab with the teacher being on campus alone in the beginning in their classroom, but having the kids be able to participate in, in labs and things like that. Your job as a parent really in this in this instant because this is uh, their big journey into um, greater autonomy is providing the space where they will be able to learn where they have a quiet um, um, a space where they have access to wi-fi uh, and please communicate to us if there are any uh, tech issues and challenges for the family because we, we know that we don't want uh, students having to depend on their cell data, for example, uh, for running their classes if there are competing interests in the family. We know that the Zoom takes a lot of bandwidth, so we want to make sure that everybody is set up and set up to, to succeed. And on that note, I'm going to um, actually uh, let my colleague Jennifer Reinwald, our, our VP for Mission, tell you about all the exciting opportunities that we're going to have that go beyond the classroom and create more engagement. Thank you. So student life um, is composed of campus ministry, student activities, the wellness counselors, deans and attendants. And the team has been working hard all summer to create meaningful programming to nurture our school community during this challenging time when we cannot all be together as we tr traditionally would be able to. Um, so here's some important highlights of things that you need to know um, right now. So first, we found a lot of questions about orientation. Um, orientation is going to be virtual this year. We are going to release um, a video on Schoology on Monday, August 10th. Um, that all students, freshmen, sophomores, juniors and seniors will watch and then they will have a check in during their fifth period at the end of the week um, to make sure that they don't have any questions um, and make sure that we clarify anything that might have come up in during that week. Um, freshmen will have uh, their welcome Zoom meetings on Monday, August 10th. Um, and that particular meeting is really a chance to uh, meet some of the, the staff that they need to know at the very beginning of the year, get some additional information um, above and beyond our orientation video, and also get a chance to spend some time with their peer counselor and their family and color group. Um, so that's going to be an important um, meeting not to miss. It'll also be the first time for some students perhaps to uh, get a chance to meet some of the other uh, freshmen that are part of that, this very special class. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about Wednesday Flex programming. Uh, I know there's lots of questions out there about how our freshmen, if they aren't allowed to come on campus, um, really going to get a chance to meet each other and build friendships. Um, our Wednesday flex days are really the purpose behind that day. Well, there's a couple purposes. One is really to build community and student engagement. Um, because during that day, there's going to be opportunities for club meetings, other community building activities, um, movement, um, as well as some um, less structured academic time in order to get ahead on assignments, uh, to work together with uh, groups on group activities, to have one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring time with a peer tutor or with a teacher. Um, it is a very important day. They're expected to be, um, all students are expected to be involved throughout that day, um, but they will have an opportunity to plan through some structure uh, to make sure that they're making those social connections and also make sure that they have some time uh, to work on their academics. Uh, clubs specifically will also be meeting on those Wednesdays. Our student activities director is working on creating a virtual club fair so that um, all students would be able to see exactly what clubs are active on campus, how to get involved, and when they are meeting. Um, also, every class will have a special Wednesday um, where their class um, is spotlight. It's a class spotlight Wednesday. The freshmen are actually going to have that very uh, first spotlight Wednesday, which is on August 19th. That day will be, um, we are doing specific programming uh, for the freshmen. We're going to include our welcome to the sisterhood liturgy um, virtually on that day and some community building activities so that the freshmen can really get a chance to meet each other, um, and build those 
community relationships. It's just some other sort of, uh, I guess, logistics things to be aware of. Uh, as Dr. Chapineau has mentioned um, and Mrs. Mix, teachers will be taking role during each class period. Uh, we have a system, our automated school messenger, that emails um, parents and guardians if a student does not uh, report to an online class. So be aware that you may receive an email if that ends up being the case. Um, if your student isn't feeling well, has a doctor's appointment, some other reason why they can't be um, online and present in their classes, still please call the school attendance line um, and uh, report the absence um, so that we just know not to worry. Um, and then we also can keep an accounting of, of people um, who are active and engaged in the classes. Um, in terms of, we've also got a lot of questions about dress code while we're in our online environment. We're following our free dress guidelines, which will, um, can be found in our student handbook, um, which will be released um, in about an, the next week or so. Um, and then in terms of a regular and dress uniform, those guidelines will be followed when we return to campus back in our hybrid um, model. So you can review the student handbook for details on that. Jennifer, okay, so we had a good question um, specifically to Flex Day. What students should be expected to wear to school on Flex Day? On Flex Day, uh, we are right now, a mo well, for Cougar Flex Day, so when it's not a class spotlight day, it's still our free dress guidelines. Um, for specific class spotlight days, that may vary. Um, so, for example, the very first spotlight day for freshmen, we are planning on running a welcome to the sisterhood liturgy. And so we will communicate with freshmen in terms of a dress guideline for that. Okay, so I think at this time, I'm we, going to we, have, we need a clarification question oh. um, for the sh freshman spotlight on the 19th. Is that virtual on campus? It's virtual. Right now, everything is virtual. Once we go back into the hybrid situation, when a class has a spotlight, we will have that class on campus while everyone else is doing a Cougar Flex at home. So I think you just answered the next question, which is what's the difference between Cougar Flex and Spotlight? spotlight yeah, the class, class specific. the class spotlight is class specific. It's designed in the hybrid environment to allow an entire class, so like the entire freshman class, to come on campus and spend some time together doing class specific things. But as of right now, we are not allowed to do that, but we are still gonna run our class spotlights, but we will run them virtually. And one more uniform question. I think when, when parents and students read the handbook, the uniform is gonna start making a lot more sense, but the, the dress guideline, oh, I'll pass to Jessica. <laughs> Um, so just a, a reminder for that uniform guide, um, we do have a uniform code, how to buy the uniform. All of those links are available on your incoming freshman page. Um, so that, that page that we've been, that we created just for the incoming uh, freshman class that you've been referring to back since March, um, it does contain the uniform code, which does talk about um, the free dress and how to buy your uniforms through Sumil. Um, so if you if you need some help, please refer to that incoming frosh page and then I'm happy to answer some questions um, from there if you need more assistance. Okay, um, I think we can move on. We have some other questions coming in, which we'll get to, but why don't we, do you still have a couple points to make, Jennifer? No, I was actually going to pass it back uh, to Jessica Mix because I know there's been some questions about um, the Frosch family barbecue. Sure. Um, I knew, unfortunately, we are not going to be able to move forward with the Frosch family barbecue in the way that we had intended, um, since we can't have anybody on campus at this point. Um, our plan is to continue as soon as we can get back to campus to, to start creating some social events for parents. So it might look a little bit different. It might be in groups. Um, again, more information to come. We're really just kind of waiting for some more guidance from um, the county health, and then we'll be able to move forward with some planning for that. Great, so it sounds like we need a little bit more clarity on flex days. Um, what, what is it, what will it look like virtually with 200 students being online? 
the interaction? Can, can you give maybe a couple examples? So for it, when we're thinking specifically, let's just talk about the freshman spotlight, the first one um, happening on the 19th. So we will have a virtual liturgy for Welcome to the Sisterhood. That will be everyone on one Zoom. But moving forward into community building activities, um, we will be breaking out freshmen, um, creating other Zooms for smaller groups uh, to meet and using the Zoom feature of breakout um, rooms within those smaller Zooms uh, for students to be able to meet each other and talk and do some community building um, activity. So we're really going to use a variety of things on Zoom in larger groups and then in smaller groups um, guided by um, some help with peer counselors and faculty and staff. Um, and we'll have some introductory um, club things, um, some things that ASB will run um, uh, with the freshmen specifically, and we'll, we'll do that. I mean, it's going to be kind of be fluid, but all students will get um, a schedule for things that we're scheduling them into. And then there will be a couple of periods of time where they'll have some choice and they'll be able to sign up for some things that they're interested in doing. And then once we know what their interests are and we divide them into groups, they will re receive Zoom links um, for those opportunities um, for our virtual spotlight. Thank you. So Kevin, how about we move on to athletics? Indeed. So everyone knows um, on our, our athletics page, we have the um, updated 2021 sports schedules um, and calendars. Um, all seasons have been put off. All CIS sports have been put off. But the fall sports begin practices um, December 14th. Tryouts will be those dates, and we're still looking at the possibility of having tryouts happen a week before those official start dates of practice. The fall sports right now are cross country, volleyball, water polo, and for across the street football. Every other sport is going to be considered a spring sport. CIF condensed the seasons into, instead of having three seasons, there are two. The typical start date for the spring sports would be March 8th, although right now soccer has a start date of February 22nd. Still working with CIF and NCS on some of those details, but again, if you go to the athletics um, webpage, you can look at the calendar and see the start dates that are set right now. Um, we are able right now to continue to do workouts in our 12 person cohorts or pods. We haven't received any further guidance from Contra Costa Health about having to eliminate those Right now, uh, we're gonna work with the county to determine if we can continue those kinds of practices um, for strength training, conditioning, and sport specific things. Um, but like everything, it's up in the air. So once we get a final determination from the county, we will obviously share that. And individual coaches will reach out with more information on those individual sports. One of the unique things that CIF has done is that they've extended the summer season all the way up until the first day of fall practice, which is December 14th. What that means is summer is, is awfully loose for the, the CIF now across the state. What it basically means is that coaches can have practices, workouts, they can even schedule friendlies uh, with games against other schools, including Catholic schools, um, when it's safe to do so. And we're able to do that, again, all the way up till December 14th, which is the first day of fall practice. So as we get permission from the county and counties around us to um, open up and be able to offer athletic competitions, we'll be able to do that for every single sport that we offer. And so again, we're working around that. That's kind of an overview. Um, we've had a couple EBAL meetings, a couple NCS meetings, and we're, we're trying to work through this as best we can, as quickly as we can. We just got the guidelines from the state about a week and a half ago. Um, so we'll continue to update, um, go to the webpage, uh, the athletics webpage, but we'll also be sending out information, sport specific information as we receive it. Um, again, we're hopeful that we can get the ball rolling with those cohorts, um, but that, that's where we are in terms of the most up-to-date athletics news that we have. 
So a question just came through about if, if a student's interested in a particular sport, how do they find out about training that might be happening before the season actually starts? We will reach out to all students. It's going to be posted on the school website and we'll list that under the sport. And then once we get that information on the individual sports, we'll release it via Schoology. We'll post it on the website and we'll, we'll send out emails, just mass emails as well to everyone um, announcing that. We'd like to do it. Once we get permission, it won't just be one sport. It'll be all sports. And when we create, and that's a lot of logistics. We have five, over 500 athletes on campus. So once we work that out, we'll message it. We'll blanket you with messaging so that you won't miss a thing. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so there's also some, a question, a clarifying question about what kind of computers kids will have access to on campus, PCs, Macs. Can we talk about that? Elizabeth, that's probably best for you. Yes, absolutely. Um, they have access to a, a bunch of computers. They are Macs. Um, the, we have a computer lab. We have computers in the library. We also have a media room um, where the students will be able to engage in, in content creation as well. So there are um, computers for them. And at this time, we do have Macs. Okay, I feel like I've answered all the questions that are live if, and some have been answered online. So I'm not sure if anybody else has, I'm sure parents have a lot of questions, but feel free to ask right now so we can use our time. We've got about 10 more minutes left. Um, there was a question last night about our ability to go from distance learning to hybrid, potentially back. Do we want to talk about a scenario that might look like that, even though we're not sure how it'll all play out. Mr. Cushing. So again, we, we're, we're bound by that 14 consecutive day decrease in the COVID metrics. Um, we'll, we'll work with the county as we kind of start that countdown. We'll hopefully have a target date. As I said, we'll, we'll make that transition from distance to hybrid um, with orientations for students. We'll have town halls around that um, because it's going to be a different campus than if we were back to normal and fully face to face. So we have that plan in place and we've worked with Del we will work with De La Salle on that as well. Um, in terms of once we're back on campus in that hybrid environment, there are specific guidelines in place related to positive testing. Um, it's basically, and again, there's a lot of gray area when we, we talk with Contra Costa County Health, to be honest with you. The basic um, parameter is that if 5% of our total population, including adults, um, has positive tests over a, either a 10 or 14 day period, then we would have the conversation about having to go back to distance learning. Um, they would consider that to be a cluster of, of positive cases. So once we get to that point, we'll explain all this again. Uh, we, we actually had math camps over the summer on campus. We could regulate those a lot easier. Um, we used five different sections of campus. There were small cohorts of 10. We staggered the start and departure times. You could split them up and do deep cleaning in between, things that we can't do even if we have half the campus here. Um, and we learned a lot from that in terms of protocols, in terms of messaging, in terms of working with Contra Costa County. I think that once we get on campus, managing um, managing the virus is, is, is doable. I think we can, we can stay in school if we're careful. The key is gonna be one, our students being responsible and following all the protocols, including distancing, including when they're not on campus. And the other big issue is gonna be the testing. If we can get results back in a day, maybe two, it would work. If, if it takes longer than that, then I think things will fall apart. But let's get to that hybrid model first. And to do that, we've gotta get the spread of the virus down. So again, we encourage everyone, here's my plug, make sure your students are practicing social distancing, that they're wearing the masks, that they're practicing the hygiene. We have to do this together if we have any chance of getting our students back on campus. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Um, so there's, some, there's a really good question about the girls um, in, as far as engagement, community building, um, not only with the freshman class, but with upperclassmen. 
Can we talk about maybe what some of those opportunities might look like in this environment? Jennifer, that might be best for you. I could take that question. So um, our clubs are um, basically have members throughout the classes and clubs will still be meeting uh, during Cougar Flex, there's club time and during um, class spotlight, there's club time. And during those times and during those club meetings, they will be in conversation with people, um, with students, um, in other classes. So that is a moment where they will be able to um, be able to speak to, build friendships with people outside of their class, as well as freshmen specifically um, have the benefit of having their senior peer counselor who's a member of the senior class. So that is one um, person um, outside of their class that they'll be able to have um, uh, a relationship with, a friendship with um as well and then as we go through the through the year and hopefully we're going to get back in the hybrid situation sooner rather than later they will be on campus in the hybrid situation with members um, of the other classes for the most part it's going to probably be those club opportunities as well as other opportunities through cougar flex like through town halls just like this that it's all students who are in a Cougar Flex situation um, can attend and other um, ASB uh, student activities, spirit weeks and spirit activities um, where they'll be able to um, spend time with um, members of other classes. Thanks, Jennifer. Elizabeth, I think this question might be good for you, but um, it's specifically with a math program. Uh, are the kids gonna be able to take regular topic tests in the virtual environment? Um, last year, it seems like it was cumulative test only? Uh, yes, I'm meeting actually with the math department um, uh, tomorrow um, to do a check in on how many of those tests will be able to be online. They have built a lot more tests through formative to provide more access to testing and they've also developed systems for um, greater access to remediation. The math program has been able to to transition very, very well to the online environment and the testing results that Kevin was referring to really show that that nothing was lost, even though they did have to adjust a little bit of the testing. Um, they outperformed anything that NWEA, uh, the testing pro company, had predicted a cohort should do. So I'm confident that what they bring up will be, will work well for the students. Thanks. Well, and we have another question in terms of uh, if a student has a HFCE first steps, how is that handled during the virtual learning? Um, and it will be time for homework and extra assistance with English and math. So yes, HFCE um, will continue to run. A big priority in that class is actually study skills and um, organizational skills. So I think it'll be even more important in a virtual environment. Um, if, if anything, that class last year when we transitioned to shelter in place, the, the teachers running the class did individual check-ins to make sure that they were okay with everything, helped guide them, played operator when they needed to, to get extra assistance, and really helped make sure that they didn't get lost in the shuffle of virtual learning. Yes, there will be assistance in math and English, but it really isn't limited to that. It's really about um, making sure that they have um, all the resources they need to be successful. All right, um, Mr. Cushing, could you talk a little bit about our relationship with De La Salle and what the planning for the year looks like with them? So we've been working with them weekly, um, and typically more often. We do share classes with juniors and seniors. Um, so again, beginning the spring when we went to our, our virtual platform, we've, we've been working with De La Salle um, on the schedule, on teacher expectations, on student expectations. So we're, we're in lockstep. Um, I think I saw a specific question related to um, the hybrid model. So yes, um, when we have shared classes, which again is typically juniors and seniors, there will be, the alphabet will be broken down because we break it down by, by class. So there will be De La Salle boys in those classes uh, on any given period. Um, what we try to do, especially with the, the block schedule, um, is that we wanted to cut down on the passing periods and things like that. So I think Dr. Chapineau, um, if that's a question, can talk a little bit more about that split with the alphabet since she is 
been diligently working on that with Lillian Dixon across the street. It's, and if you've never, and most of you I'm sure haven't, tried to schedule an 800 student high school, um, it's, not, it's not as easy as an elementary school, even a school that maybe has five or 600 students because they have one teacher with maybe a homeroom teacher. We have, our kids have seven teachers, seven periods, 35 to 40 classes every period, and we do mix with De La Salle. It's a logistical nightmare to try and divvy that up. So I think Dr. Chapineau might be able to share a little bit more about that aspect of, of the hybrid. Myself. Yeah, mute. So yeah, so a couple a couple of things on the the hybrid and on the way we set up the schedule. As uh, Mr. Cushing was pointing out, we work the schedule. Usually we were odd and even when we were on block um, before, and now we've kept things in order: one, two, three, seven, and then the next day is four, five, six, uh, zero. That essentially means that the back and forth um, for at least for freshmen happens um, really just on the days where we are one, uh, one, two, three, and seven, because we do not share, with the exception of period four, five, six, and zero are not typically shared classes. So that really limits the back and forth in that sense. We know that we're also gonna be uh, running a closed campus for lunch so that we make sure that we keep students here. But in terms of um, just the general way the hybrid will run, um, when you have, it doesn't work out as beautifully as half the class, but we know that we have to cap the number of students from each alphabet group um, in a classroom so that we can ensure that the classroom allows for the social distancing space. The teachers um, are, are, will work their system a little bit differently. Some may stagger what happens uh, in the classroom. Others may just set up the whole class as a, uh, the week as a system of menus, of, of work menus, and that when they're on site, they benefit from the menu that requires the absolute physical teacher uh, interaction. And, and that can happen either if they're Monday, Tuesday, or they're Thursday, Friday, that would not matter. There's, there's a lot of ways to set it up. The most part, I mean, if we're, we're using an elementary school since you used it for scheduling, um, working in centers is the most effective way with the hybrid model for them to, to have students transition into different activities and, and work. There, there, there are wonderful benefits to this hybrid model in that the teachers will be able to have major interaction with a, sl a smaller group and give students more voice during the times where they are in class. Did I cover that? I think you did a fine job, thank you. <laughs> so a lot of the questions that we had specifically maybe to uniform concerns things, they've been, they've been addressed um, with the individual questions. And um, I think we're, we're, we're kind of at our time frame right now. Um, and I know that Jessica will probably be the best resource to go to for information. And if she's not the right person, she will definitely be able to find the right person to answer your questions. This will all be online. Again, I encourage you to go to our COVID um, webpage on our website. We will keep that as up to date as anything that's going on will be found there. So unless anybody has any um, things they might feel like they forgot to mention, uh, we want to make sure that we keep the lines of communication open. We know there's always going to be a lot of questions. Again, we anticipate having more, more town halls. We will do orientations when we're working to get back on campus. Um, but we feel like this is an effective way to, to communicate in real time. And so we appreciate all of you joining us tonight and um, your interest in this. We are, despite the unusual circumstances, we're really looking forward to a great year together. Um, the staff and the faculty have been working all summer long to make sure the environment we're creating for our students is the best possible under these conditions. And we know it takes a partnership, a very solid partnership with, with the parents and the families and the students to make sure that uh, we're all on the same expectations and they have the best experience possible. So um, thank you for being here tonight and we look forward to a fabulous year welcoming your daughters and um, it will make it work.